This uh, hour-long film is going to have a little review of a cache of tools that I've acquired, do some workshop work setting up the uh, one of the axes, the way I like them, and doing a bit of work debarking and hewing. Mm, not sure about this. Yet another hewing film without any particular film trick or anything, I don't know. Do you think I should introduce it at the beginning? Just say. Let me do that now. If you're not interested in watching another one of these hewing films where I just do the work, you should click out now. But hello, Skarkniv. Bondkniv. Band knife. This one is curved in two axes. It's got quite a wide edge. Uh, the form of it is quite wide. It's four and a half centimetres. <coughs> but uh, someone uh, an acquaintance bought some equipment from a blacksmith in Telemark, but then decided that they wouldn't they wouldn't use it. So I'm going to take it off their hands for want of a better way to describe it. But they're quite expensive tools. It's not something that I would actually buy normally, but. Uh, This is a West Telemark Biel. So this is straight from the blacksmith. And this one is um, a scissor honed, I don't know what you'd say, sucks a schlipt, it's called in Norwegian. It's only got one bevel. Got some sticky gaffer tape on it. Anyway, straight from the blacksmith. It's got his mark on it. It's a, I don't know, enormous, enormous axe. I've never used an axe this size. I think really it's probably for um, hewing, or if you're lofting with or cogging making timber houses, log houses, with very, very large timber. Um, what the, what's good about that, it's called shinning, the, uh, the beveled edges that you make, the kind of sloped beveled edges that you make in the Scandinavian saddle notch. If the timber is very big, you know, like uh, 60 centimetres, timber and you need the blade to be half half of the length of the timber this one is 35 37 37 centimeters from the edge to the heel so you could be doing 60 70 centimeter timber with this which I've never done and probably never would do because that kind of timber doesn't grow in this area But they, they, he's got a good reputation, this uh, smith. But there, are, obviously, it's a production, it's a production thing. So uh, there are, I mean, there are lots of small errors with the way it's been put together here. The handle has been put on with the bits of a bit of gap here and there. I mean, it might not have any difference, but it might not make any difference, but. <coughs> But that's because this is a machine-made handle, and uh, it has a very fixed size. The this bit, whatever that's called in English. But um, I would have to do a bit of work on this to use it in the uh, to use it 
because the edges are too sharp for me. I like those edges to be nice and smooth, otherwise you can't push on the, on the steel. And then we'll have a go with that. This is a smaller one. That's a bit more like my, my axe that you've seen me use in the other films probably. Now I tried this at work yesterday and uh, hit a, a nail with it several times I didn't realize because I was wearing headphones I didn't hear the um, the noise of hitting a nail so I put about four notches in the <coughs> in the edge um, and uh, actually in a way it's quite good that I've done that because it gives me an idea about the, the kind of steel that's in this um, how brittle it is and uh, you know it, what kind of temper it has because I don't know this Smith I've, I've never met him or talked to him or anything so I don't know how he tempers and which steel he uses and stuff. Um, but as I say, it comes from this area, a very traditional area in Telemark, which is. Uh, and he comes from a family of smiths, so I'm sure he's using. I'm sure he knows what he's doing. But of course, each axe is an individual thing, and until you actually use it, you don't really know how it's going to behave. And I'd say this steel is quite. Uh, isn't too brittle. It's not too. Uh, it's not too hard, which I think is a good thing. There's always a balance between holding an edge and uh, not chipping too much because when you're working with old timber, it's not just that you hit nails, but you also hit the 200 year old spruce knots, and they're uh, as hard as nails, literally, and they will chip an axe if it's too, if it's too brittle, too hard. I mean, this is a, essentially this is an interesting. This is his draw knife. This is actually not as wide as mine across the blade, I see. Now, lots of people ask me where my axe came from, the my lufter beaver, the one that they've seen in the other films, and I tell them the person who made them. But he hasn't, that Smith hasn't responded to those, to people that have got in touch with him and I think that's probably because he's, he maybe doesn't work that much anymore, he's, he's, he was middle-aged when I bought my tools from him in 1994, so I don't know how old he is now. So it's uh, got a very steep bevel on it, that, that, that is too steep for me, I would like that much less than that. So. See the difference. My my bevel is uh, maybe something like 12 degrees or something, whereas this one is closer to 25. So. But you know, I mean, I've used the same tools for a long time. They weren't expensive tools when I bought them. They're made for hobbyists. But. I'm not really a tool geek. I mean, I've got quite a lot of tools, but I'm not that bothered about having excellent tools or spending a lot of money on them. Like I say, these are tools that I'm looking through now, these new tools, they're much, they're well out of my price range, really. I don't, I'm only, I don't know. Maybe I was foolish to even say that I would take my hands. So if any, of you, if any of you want to buy these tools, just get in touch with me, because uh, like I say, I don't really can't afford to, uh, I can't afford to have them, to buy them. <clears throat> this is called a Meerdrag Sivir, and it's for doing the, the dip in the timber. You know, it's, uh, he's doing a lot of machine work. He's obviously trying to churn these out pretty quickly, you know, and so Obviously the, the finish is, uh, understandably, it's understandably the finish isn't that great really. So that's, you know, wobbles in the blade and stuff. So, the fact is if you, these tools get so much they, you know, so much happens to them when you actually use them. It's just that kind of thing. I don't think it really makes a difference because you're going to be spending time honing your tools anyway. And like I say, I'm probably not going to use these tools. 
But I mean, they're the kind of heirloom tools, the kind of things that last hundreds of years, and people, the people that that you that will use something like this will get very familiar with it, and it'll, it's familiarity, probably, has as much to do with getting the most out of your tools as anything else. So they're kind of the same with computers. I don't know. I've got a lot of very old computers, and they work for me because they. Well, I don't update them at least to a minimal amount, because uh, the updates is what ruins the computers. It's trickery, isn't it? Again, it's a very, very steep bevel. I don't know if that's a, a good thing. Also, I, actually, personally, I don't like these ones where, the, where your hands are, are pointed that way, because it means that you have to... It all to do with your wrist grip. All of the strength that you use to do the work is based on your wrist grip. Whereas with a with this kind of handle, you don't have to grip it at all. All you have to do is, you know, just hold hold against it. I mean, obviously there's a bit of, there's a bit of grip involved, but but you don't have to squeeze it. That's the point. You just relax and you let the tendons go at the end of their their stretch kind of thing so that it's more like a taut rope the hand rather than something that's squeezing and using muscle so you're using your tendons and not your muscles whereas this you actually have to hold it which means you have to use muscles as well as tendons and I think that, that is going to be very tiring and that's why this tool really isn't a tool for uh, I don't think it's really for making timber houses it's more for making buckets it's called a bond knieve in Norwegian and it means a band knife which is what the band is the name of the thing that you have around a wooden bucket And that's why it is different from this this kind of knife, Skydavkniv or Travkniv or whatever they're called. But, you know, again, the name's not important. <coughs> and then there's a couple of heavy-duty um, chisels. A straight one and a curved one. I'm not going to get those out because. You know, and then this is called a Meerdrags Kniv. This is a, a marking gauge. So you can put a wedge to open that up and then you tighten it onto the wedge. So you, those of you who've done some work making timber houses know what this is. It's a line scribe. So you tighten that up once it's sits or you just knock it down with a hammer once it's the right gap. I don't actually have any videos of, uh, I don't think, of doing proper lufting because uh, I haven't done any for quite a while. Mostly restoration is what I do. So, there we go. That's a quick review and then I'll do some filming of using these tools in a bit. So, I say, these are straight from the smith. They've got the nice edge on them. people's tools sometimes or you know just to try and have a look or appreciate other people's tools and uh, I recognize the this one as, uh, as being too narrow for me it's too narrow you don't get enough it doesn't function enough like a plane because of its narrowness and I want I want this thing to function like a plane because I want to be able to go over knots smooth out the surface in exactly the same way that a plane does. It's nice and light though. It's lighter than mine. It's maybe good for taking the bark off. The, these handles are a bit smaller than mine. So, oh, it's just something I noticed. I don't know. It makes no, no difference really probably. I don't have particularly big hands. Well, it works. So a quick go with mine just to compare. It's 
still in shot. Oh, mine is much sharper. Uh, actually, mine's more aggressive as well. Much, very, very different. Much sharper. I, it's not really sharper, it's more, it's cutting. It's more aggressive. And I don't know why that is, but uh, probably the combination of the lower angle of the bevel and the wider, the, this wide, this here, uh, is keeping it level, even though it's got that low angle. I'm much more I'm much more used to mine. Uh, I mean, this one's just touching the surface. I don't know. Different, different. Maybe it has its uses. I don't know. There we go. Anyway. The next eight minutes of this film are going to cover putting a new bevel and a new edge on this Luftbeele, the bearded axe. And I'm just going to let the camera roll. I'm not going to edit this down so that if anybody's really interested in doing this, you can see the process in detail. And if you're not interested, just scroll forward. Later on in the film, I'll be doing some stripping off the bark from some from a piece of spruce, and then doing some hewing. So this is just a little inexpensive water wheel that I bought about 15 years ago. Um, it does the job. It's not it's a, not completely stable. I don't have it bolted to the workbench because I need the space so I move it around a bit. So I'm just watching the footage and I'll s tell you a little bit about what I'm actually trying to achieve. Um, so I'm, I'm now trying to change the angle of the bevel. I'm knocking off the back edge of the bevel because it's been clearly it's been uh, set up using a belt sander, and uh, that's been done for the speed of production. Um, I don't use a belt sander. I think it's all right to do it if you have very uh, new sandpaper on your belt sander, but I think it's not really a very good idea because when you get down to that very sharp edge, obviously the metal there being so thin will heat up very easily. And it, of course, the uh, steel is very sensitive to the temperature. The, if it heats up more than a couple of hundred degrees, it really changes the qualities of the edge. Um, so I use the this water wheel and just hand honing once I've changed the shape how I want it and uh, that seems to work pretty well my axe usually keeps a good edge
So in this shot now, I can just see the little triangle being formed by water across the edge of the blade. And that shows you when you're actually grinding the edge. You're not grinding the edge until that little triangle appears, this kind of faster flowing water over the edge there and there. So uh, that's me trying to get rid of the nicks. There are four nicks in a row where I've struck the, the um, nail four times in a row. And obviously I have to grind the edge, I have to grind the whole edge a little bit, otherwise it will lose its shape, because you want that nice little bow that it's got. You don't want the edge to start becoming flat. So you can kind of see that the bevel is getting longer as well. And I'm trying to achieve, instead of this slightly roof pitch shaped point on the axe, I'm trying to achieve more of a bullet shape. And uh, the reason why I prefer that bullet shape is because I think that it's easier to direct the, the blow and also when you're using it as a plane it's easier to direct it when it's very flat it it tends to get dug into the grain more um, well i'm just going on what i remember of using other people's equipment because uh, obviously With experience, you 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 have experience with one tool more than than than, the, than other people's, of course. So, and well, now you can see a really clear triangle. So that's the edge being being ground, and then I take the grind from the edge to from from the very right point of the blade to the heel of the of the bevel. So I'm grinding out that straight ridge that would have been there from the belt sander. And that way you can have quite quite a thick blade but still be very sharp at the point. Whereas if you use a belt sander and have two straight bevels, it's actually much thinner at the point. Uh, I mean it's much thinner behind the point. In order to get a good point, it has to be it has to be thinner behind as well, which I I think is dangerous for especially when it comes to chipping because it it, it often results in much bigger chips happening when you hit something hard. Um, plus, I like th I like sine curves. I think they are uh, an integral part of traditional building sine curves. It's the Especially with Norwegian building, I mean, if you look, think of a Viking boat, I mean, it's made almost exclusively out of sine curves. It's just natural that they would be then adopted in other aspects of woodcraft. And on the water wheel like this, I tend to use this technique of doing a little bit at a time and th then all the lines are going in one direction. But when I hone, I'll, I'll very often hone across the length. And those last little straight across the length actions there they'll be very very light because I'm just working right on the very edge just want to get that edge up to like polishing the edge and m most of my homes are at the workshop I mean uh, are on the building site so um, that's actually just a straightening block and that's a black Arkansas stone it's a bit too fine really
I usually use diamond homes when I'm on the building site. And I, that's where they are. I've got three or four diamond homes and they're, they're at work. Oh, it's very sharp. a bit of getting used to that. It's very heavy for me. Much heavier than what I'm used to. Probably good for the hewing and everything. Oh, it works quite nicely this, yeah. Nice and sharp. Doesn't cut in, uh, it's not as aggressive as mine. It stays kind of across the surface, which is, uh, maybe that's a good thing. Not quite sure which way up this piece of tin is supposed to be. Maybe that way. It should be that way up. Very heavy. There's a good way to, I don't know, 150 kilos maybe. 
very heavy. I mean, it's heavy even when it's when the sides have been taken off. Oh well, yeah, it's nice. This it's nice. It works nicely on this fresh, fresh timber. these ends over a bit better. Stop that rattling. Right though. I'd like to pull this down the hill but it's too heavy. I can't manage it on my own, not without some kind of clever assisting machine or a winch or a tripod or something but I don't I don't know, I haven't got one. So, my reckoning is that once I've taken the sides off, it will be light enough. The one that I did the other day in that film the other day is already down the hill there. So it's a lot lighter than this. So I don't know how many kilos it will shed when I take the sides off, but it's going to be quite a lot. 15, 20, 30 kilos maybe. was up on trestle so I could do this standing up. I don't know how many more I'm going to do in this wood. Maybe if I've got about, if I've got as many as 10 or 15 more to do and maybe it's worth making some trestles. I don't want to spend time making them and then end up not using them for 10 years and then rot away in the woods here. goes to show in a way that the advice you give about using tools is probably useless because they're so different one tool to another. This is so different to the one I'm used to. It kind of makes you realise how foolish it is to be sure of things that are actually very variable. Also be that this timber has dried out a little bit more than the other ones. It's had a four or five days more drying time. So that could just result in the, the Cambrian being uh, more uh, drier and sitting stick, sticking to the wood more.
try to put it, it does glide along the top. It's more difficult to cut in. The important thing with that chalk line thing is that you do it vertically. But here I'm just kind of roughing it a bit because I'm up in the woods and I don't have lots of tools with me. I didn't bring a spirit level or anything. And this isn't level anyway, this is on, on the slope. You probably can't see it in the video, but the incline here is very much 20% or something. It's a bit too thick, the handle for me here. That's jarring a lot on the fingers. Because it's slightly too pointed at that point here. For this job at least. Give me blisters if I'm not too careful. Just try and let go of the handle a bit more. Stone there. I better put it up on the stone.
nicely, it's heavy. I'm gonna have to slow down my pace a lot. I've never weighed my axe, so I don't know what the difference is. Number. But, you know, it's... Seems rather heavy or a lighter one. That way you've only got two numbers. Heavier or lighter. Maybe they're on to something with the South Americans, but only a count of seven. Save a lot of internet arguments actually, when I think I'm count to seven. It's not automatic, isn't it? Oh, auto. Alright, I think I might have messed up the filming because I didn't have it on automatic. So I, I couldn't cut any deeper. It's, it's a very stiff handle this, it, it's got the grain on the three quarter and I know that everybody wants to have their grain going that way because it's stronger but that's really for, depends on what you're doing really isn't it, you don't really need the strength for this. I like to have my grain going that way because that gives you better damp, uh, damping, shock absorption. Also these, these, the technique here is a lot of prying. So that's how you break your your axe by using it as a lever, cantilever. Bloody mosquitoes! They're early this year. Right, babbling. But you do need to do this with this technique to break the fibres. Otherwise you can't get these runs off like that, these long strips. And the thing is the strips help to protect yourself from the blows. You'll notice when I start doing this, if it's in shot now, but the first few hits I make, the axe handle is further cl closer to the timber. And that's because I don't want to chop my feet. But later on, as this part here gets bigger, that protects you, so you can then start to sh hit it with the handle pointing upwards towards your own legs. You watch these things carefully, you see there's a kind of logic movement. But uh, that it shows you the, the thing of bending it sideways. So you don't want to have the weakest part of your axe sideways either really. So it just goes to show that if you're doing depending on what you're doing, different rules apply. That's why making up rules in the first place are stupid. Well not stupid, but it's only the part of the way. The, in Buddhism they got this saying that Oh no, I won't bother with those. Start doing body staying, that's silly, isn't it? Anyway, the fact is, don't go repeating the stuff I've said as if it were some kind of truth, because it's not, it's just, a, it's just an opinion. Um, really, it's much better to judge it on the basis of what you can manage to do with the knowledge. If you can't actually do this kind of work with the stuff someone's telling you, I don't know, I can't talk shit. It's too much. Most things you start talking, you can't stop.
Let's just dump up the rock. It's resting on the rock. Works nicely that. It's got a much deeper sound than mine. Mine's got a much lighter ping that sound when it pings. Is that to do with the tempering or what? with the big one or not, maybe I should save that for the bigger timber. Which is probably a good idea to save it, so I've worked up a little bit of strength because I uh, probably haven't got the strength to use that big axe. See that I think the bigger axe goes through the knots a little bit better than the lighter one. But uh, yeah, it's much more tiring. Or maybe I'm doing it a bit too fast. I think the handle could just for me be a little bit smaller. Thinner. bit of backache from lifting those heavy logs as well. Be a bit careful because get the prolapse.
Steve Tyson. I suppose once one comes, loads of them come. You've kind of gone from being a hard winter to a almost like an early summer, really. Too much coffee today. Talking like a bloody. Hot. Well, I don't think the edge of this that top edge here is not picking up. Uh, I'm used to using that edge very accurately and this is a little bit too thick um, for what I'm used to so I need to change the technique a little bit. I can't go in. I need to use a bigger angle. More oblique angle. Interesting because I always thought that my actually I thought that actually my often my axe is a lot thicker than a lot of people in the industry. A lot of the younger people. Oh, I'm younger ones. Loads of them have very very thin edges on their axes, and I don't know. I find that it's uh, that it's more difficult to direct the axe when it's very very thin. It follows the grain more than what you're after. Mm. Not sure about this. Yet another hewing film without any particular film trick or anything, I don't know. Do you think I should introduce it at the beginning? Just say. Let me do that now. If you're not interested in watching another one of these hewing films where I just do the work, you should click out now because that's what this one's going to be again. Hewing. Oh, and there's so far, there's lots of coffee babble as well. I'm trying out this new axe. It's uh, not something that I've looked, gone up to look for specifically. It's uh, someone has bought it and then regretted buying it and asked me if I would take it off their hands for them. why I got it, so I thought I'd try it and see what the difference is. Massive, the difference is massive. It's a much heavier axe than the, the ones I'm used to using. All three of my axes that I've been using for the whole time I've been doing this, they all weigh a fraction of this one.
shot. Definitely the heavier axe goes through the knots easier. But my hands are tired, my wrists are tired, I need to try and relax a little bit, get the hang of the correct angle of attack. It's not the same as my act, it's a bit... I don't know quite what the difference is. It feels different that way. dangerous Not bad. Oh! Well, I'm too tired to do the other side. Not sure. up a little bit with the um, band knife. 